Today we're talking to Casey Walsh, owner of Stand Up Guys Junk Removal. Casey started Stand Up Guys as a senior in high school and his business now generates over $7 million per year. Let's go inside and find out how he does it. Our prices aren't the cheapest. We are gonna go after customers that we believe can easily afford our service. And the people that are looking for a company that's insured and marketed and we vet our employees, like things like that, people will pay extra for that type of service, but there's a certain type of people that will pay that. So Casey, can you tell us about your first junk removal service you started in high school? So. When I was a senior in high school, I would work with my dad, a junior and senior, my dad's a contractor, okay. and I would work with him out on the jobs. Um, and one of the things that he taught me to do was drive his truck and trailer so that anytime like we were, you know, if we're working and stuff got, the trailer got filled up, it's like, you can take it to the dump. Okay. And at the time it was the best for me because it was like, window, I called it, we called it window time. It's like, I don't have to be a grunt on the job. I get to drive for a while and get sure. paid. So. I got kind of used to doing that, like where the dump was and like how to drive the truck and trailer. And then uh, one day we were on a job and some lady was like, I'm getting ready to leave. And she's like, hey, we, can you take my, this couch or something? It was under her a deck. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And I went and I asked my dad, he was like, yeah, just tell her 150 bucks or something like that. And I was like, that's insane. But I did it anyways. And she goes, oh yeah, no problem. And that was like, the light bulb went off. I was like, oh, there's like, that was the first time I saw like, not that I got the money, but I saw money for that type of service. Sure. Um, and then it was kind of off to the races. At that time, I was 17 years old, senior in high school. I was putting out like little road signs and flyers on Word and like printing it out and then just putting it on mailboxes right. and stuff like that. But I would just work on the weekends. Um, but that was, yeah, that was kind of how I started. I mean, it wasn't stand up guys at that time. Sure. Um, cause I, I did it while I was in high school, made beer money, you know, whatever it was. And then after high school, I went off and I started doing other things. I was doing odd jobs and I was finding myself. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> when was stand up guys officially started then? When I was 20. So I, yeah, it's a long, little bit of a story, but I was at a, I was kind of lost. Like I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was trying to, I was doing different things and I was trying to find like, you know, what am I going to do with my life? And I was at a Mexican restaurant uh, with some friends and we paid the bill and we're walking out and I'm, there's a convoy, there's probably five of us. And I'm the last one in line. And as I'm walking, this, this man grabs my arm from a booth and he was like, and he like got my attention and he's sitting there with his wife and his two kids. And he, and he said something along the effect of like, hey, I was watching you and I wanted to tell you this. And he was like, you need to read this book. And he wrote it down on a, on a piece of paper and, he, and on his receipt and he handed it to me. And I was so shook by it that I was like, that was so weird that I actually went and bought the book the next day and okay. read it. And it was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And while I was reading the book, I was like, I need to start my own business. And I was like writing down like, this is what, I, and I was like, well, I already did something once. Cause like even before then I was like cutting lawns and stuff. I would always try and do different things. But I was like, I'll just pick something so I can get started cause I want to work for myself. That was the whole thing. Um, and I just picked junk removal. And at 20 years old, I just went back and I got, I, I borrowed the trailer from my dad again. And then I, the business was born from there. Nice. Yeah. So I think that a lot of our viewers are debating between going to college or going into a trade. Do you have any advice that you would give to them on, you know, one way or another or the choices that you personally made? Well, it's always going to be a biased opinion. I didn't go to school. Sure. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to university or anything like that. Um, I have always thought that there is a litany of ways to make money. It doesn't have to be school. Um, I think that if someone had a career in mind, and school was the pathway for that, I think that would be a good idea. But just to go to school to go to school, in my humble opinion, I think it's a terrible idea. If you want to be an electrician, go get a, you know, go to sure. the trade school and become an electrician. Don't just right. like start, you know, ripping into people's houses and telling them you're an electrician. Right. But, uh, or if you want to be a doctor, go to school to be a doctor. But I don't think it's necessary 
to live a successful life and obviously success is dependent on the person, right? So it's like you, people need to pick what they want out of life and then take that path. And I don't think you know, school and school debt and all that is always the answer uh, to everything. But if there's a certain path that you want and school is the answer to that, take it. But I just would not recommend somebody going to school just to go to school. Well, one of the things, you know, if people are thinking of starting their own business, the big impediment to starting your own business is often funding. Yep. Can you tell us about you know, your funding story of getting stand-up guys going and how you managed to you know, pull that together to manifest start stand-up guys? Basically what I was saying is like, if you go my route, it is gonna be small steps and it's like you have to make money to grow. Um, and you have to be okay with eating ramen noodles and living in a one bedroom apartment for a long time because that's what I did. Um, you, those are the sacrifices you make if you bootstrap it. But there are plenty of opportunities out there. I mean, there's SBA loans you can get. Um, there's lines of credit you can get. Um, if you have decent credit, you can get a business line of credit for, you know, you can get a $10,000 infusion easy. Is there an advantage to bootstrapping it? You don't owe anybody anything. I think yeah. I've always thought that, I mean like, I personally am not a fan of debt. Sure. I don't want to carry, I, I want to carry as le least amount of debt on my own personal as possible. Um, and any kind of infusion of capital from um, a loan of any sort, it's going to be debt and like, you're going to be the personal guarantee on it. So it's, sure. you know, that's the, that's the risk you run with it. But you know, if you're confident in what you're doing and then you can make that money back, it's like, take the risk, mm -hmm. you know? Um, if I would have known more about funding when I was 20 years old, I probably would have went after more money. Um, I wouldn't do as much now because it's more about, you know, I have a family to take care of and think about, so I don't take the same amount of financial risks that I once did. Because mm -hmm. um, 10, 15 years ago, if I took a risk with the business and it didn't work out, it was like, what's the worst that's gonna happen sure. type thing. Um, but yeah, as you get older and that all depends on where your life is and you know who you are and what your credit is like, There's a lot of different variables I would say to that sure. But there's different there's definitely different avenues you can take to get money or you can start a business Especially in the trades or in the service industry You can start a business and bootstrap it with uh, with small amounts of capital mm -hmm. And then just make money as you you know make money with your service as you go And that's what you fund your business with is the money coming in Sure. So other than funding, what other impediments would you see to starting a business like this for someone that is, you know, is thinking about doing that? People. Okay. Yeah, I would say that's the, that's the biggest, no, I wouldn't, it's not an impediment. It's, it's hard to say because I don't want to say people are an impediment, but it's like good people are, it's the, it's, that's how you build a business is with good sure. people. Um, and they're not always just walking right through the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a big thing is like, you have to learn how to find, identify and keep good people. And that's how you can build a business. Cause two good people could walk through the door. If one, you can't identify them, they're walking right out. Or if two, if you don't know how to retain them and like, and give them what they need, they're also gonna leave. Sure. Um, and having good people come in and out of, of a revolving door doesn't do anything for your business. Right. Um, but all business, you know, business is just people. So you need good people to run a good business. On another note, safety. That's something that like, I, especially as a young man, didn't put any mind to at all. Okay. Um, and it caught up to me as we grew because it wasn't a part of like my, the culture of our business. Um, safety was not a big thing. Sure. Um, and then, we started to, there was, there was accidents on the road, guys getting hurt on the job. It became all of a sudden like a snowball effect and it was happening all the time. That was really hard to one, turn that ship in the other direction and two, just financially what it did. Sure. Um, and it's like, there's, you know, one bad accident will put you out of business. Right. So safety has to be on the top of your mind, no matter what type of business you're doing. It's like for us, I mean, our, my guys are on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like driving safely has to be pushed all the time. Sure. Um, and that's something I didn't do early on. I guess we're going back to the start of the business. Are there some just like general steps that you would say to start this business, to start junk removal, this is the general step-by-step -step process to 
starting your business? I mean, did yeah. you get a truck, you know what? I mean, yeah. how general, you know, well, is that? I guess the first and foremost is you have to have a way to transport it, right? Right. So that's gonna be your number one thing is like have a, a, a type of truck. I started with a pickup truck and a trailer. You can, do, you can do a moving truck. You could take a big investment and do a dump truck. You can do different things, but a way to, tra to uh, the first and foremost, before you're like, I have to find a customer or I have, to, I have to pick an area or I have to figure out how I'm gonna do my advertising, you have to know how you're gonna do the service. Sure. Right? So I think that would be the first thing that somebody does. You know, if you're gonna be, if you're like, I want to build decks, it's like you better learn how to build a deck before you start to go find a customer, right. right? So I would say knowing that you can provide the service that you're trying to get paid for sure. would be the first thing, um, and then second, yeah, identify the type of customer you're going after. Okay, um, and that makes that makes advertising, marketing, all those things a lot easier to hone in on when you have that customer that you're looking for, the customer that you want to go after. Sure, um, I think that that would be kind of the steps I take. But then you get into the, you know, marketing and bookkeeping and, um, the, you know, and it, yeah, hiring, like there's all, there's sure. a million different steps, but yeah, it's make sure you can provide the service that you want to get paid for and then identify the customer that you want to pay you for that service. Okay. Which would be the simplest way for me to say it. Sure, yeah. that makes sense. So as you guys have been successful, you've branched out to multiple locations. Uh, how do you determine those locations and what are you looking for when you know are expanding the business? I have built the business and expanded it based on people. Okay. Um, and so I don't have a grand master plan of how I pick a new city. It's for the most part, other than maybe a few of them, it has been, we have a great leader within the business. They, they come to me or one of my other people and they say, hey, I wanna grow. What do I need to do? And we say, well, right now we have the capital and we want to go into a new market. And if they say, I'm game, what I've done is tell them, what city do you want to go to? Because you're the one that has to move. You're the one that has to uproot your life. And it's like, everybody has junk. So I can find the socioeconomic you know, area within a major city that we can go after, right? Sure. So for, the, for us, it has been, hey, what city do you want to move to? What would make you happy? And then that's where we go. Sure. Um, and that's why we've wound up in cool cities like Austin or Nashville or Dallas or Tampa, like that's why we've kind of gone in these major places. Because that's where people want to go. that's where people want to go, yeah. Uh, speaking of service, what are the services that Stand Up Guys provides? So we provide basic junk removal. Somebody wants to get rid of some junk from their house, no matter what it is, we'll take it. Even if they want to get debris from the backyard or a couch in the basement, or clean out an attic, we do it. House clean outs, hoarder clean outs, any kind of junk somebody wants to get rid of, we'll do it. Okay. Uh, we also provide basic labor. So two to three guys you need to do something, whether it's moving, rearranging furniture within your house or unloading a U-Haul. Uh, we do that for people. And then we also rent dumpsters. So, okay. yep, so if, for the people out there that are like the do-it-yourselfers that want to slowly get rid of their junk at their own time, they just rent a dumpster from us and then we put it down, they fill it up and we pick it up. You know, as you're expanding out, obviously the biggest thing when you have a new location is finding clients to support that new location. What methods do you use to bring in new clients and sustain the, the new locations? So that is the hardest, that's the name of the game when you get somewhere, um, is finding there's like, especially when you're going into a new city, you have no brand recognition there. You have nothing. You kind of have to start at the bottom. We've, for the most part, identified areas like zip codes that we want to go after. Okay. Um, and then like, you know, certain socioeconomic places, you know, I've always looked for, one of the things I look for is a, a saturated suburban area. That's what I'm trying to go after. Um, so we'll find those areas and then try to target our marketing in those areas. I mean, you're talking about flyers, bandit signs, um, Google ads, um, mailers, all kinds of stuff. But if you, if you, if you, instead of just saying like, let's use Austin for example, instead of just being like, I'm gonna advertise all over Austin and hopefully because my, my, my reach is bigger of where I'm advertising, I'll get more work. It doesn't work as well and your dollar doesn't go as far as if you pick five zip codes right, in, in, you know, right together and you put all your money right there and then you expand out. Okay. Are you looking to start a new business or to grow an existing business? 
If so, check out the Heavy Ape course, which shows contractors and tradesmen how to grow a business that generates millions of dollars per year. We'll put a link in the description below. We were just talking about service that you provide. One of the hardest things when you're starting a new business is figuring out how to estimate the pricing for new jobs. How do you go about determining what price to charge and what's an effective way of estimating new jobs now? In the beginning, I just was guessing. I had okay. no idea what I was doing. Um, I've told this to other people before too. This is off on a tangent, but when I first started doing it, I thought I invented it. So I was like, I invented a service. Like there's nobody, like I thought like I'm, I never saw Sanford and Sons when I was a kid and there wasn't franchises like there are now. I mean, there's, there's, there was one franchise out there, um, but it wasn't till two months in that I was doing it that I saw, I saw one of the, I saw a 1-800-GOT-JUNK truck and I was like, oh, I didn't invent this. <laughs> um, but after, you know, guessing and kind of, it was more of like just guessing and then figuring out like what is a healthy margin sure. and then like kind of adjusting it from there. Um, but as years went on too, it became more of a competitive aspect and I get people do it all the time. I always know when someone's calling and they're trying to get an idea how they should price by how we price. Um, but that's definitely a way people do it because you don't want to, you don't want to be the lowest price in town, okay. but you don't want to be the highest price in town. Right? So I think when you're, if you're starting a new business, you kind of want to fall right there in the middle um, and then adjust your your processes and procedures around to make a healthy margin on that price. Because um, you don't want to be the cheapest in town just because it's, I don't, it's not, that's not a long-term successful answer to that sure. question. Um, and I think a lot of people, customers, when they're looking out there, a lot of people know it's like, nothing's more expensive than cheap labor. Right, so it's like, you don't want to perceive yourself, you don't want your business to be perceived as the cheap solution, sure. because people are going to assume that you're going to offer a cheap service. That for me at least, I wouldn't want to be associated with my brand at any time, where it's like, oh, this is a cheap service. Sure. So I've always been big on using words like that too, like don't use the word cheapest, or you know, affordable, or anything like that, because it, it, it gives the perception to somebody that you're gonna give a lesser service because you charge less. Sure. Um, but then it's, on the other hand too, it's like, you know, if you if our price is too high or you think our price is high, it's like, it's because the service we offer is legitimate. Like we try to offer the best service we can to fall within that price. We're not just trying to overcharge people. It's like, sure. you know, I here, we try to pay our people really well. We try to pay them more than the, than the competitors. Um, we try to keep our trucks clean, our guys uniformed. We, you know, we try to keep a, a nice website. We do all these things, like all that costs money. So it's like, that's part of the service. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can haul a, a couch out of a house, but like everything else leading up to it, that's all, you know, that's all money that we spend to provide a better service for people. Sure. Um, like even, you know, with us, customers get a text message at the beginning of their window and they get like a little GPS link that shows where our truck is, right? So it's like, that doesn't make your junk removal, like when we haul the couch out, doesn't make it any better, but it is part of the whole service. You know, when we're gonna arrive, you know, sure. all of those things, like that all plays into it as well. Again, the way we charge is because of the, like the insurance that we carry, that we're protected when we're on your, on your property, all those things, because if you are paying somebody and you're going with the cheapest option, you don't even know if they're insured and a guy goes on your property and breaks his arm, it's like, who's paying for that? You are. Sure. Um, so that's another part of like, where our price comes from and things sure. like that. So there's a lot of, you know, I know that's a long winded answer, but that there's a lot of factors that go into what you should charge. Um, but you know, charge accordingly for your service and try not to be the cheapest. You had mentioned like branding and promotion as mm -hmm. part of the, the whole service that you provide. Mm -hmm. What role does that perception play in you acquiring new customers, like kind of the brand and the perception that people have of it? And does build did building that brand come naturally to you um that's my favorite part of business so maybe it comes naturally i don't know uh, it's what i've enjoyed the most um as i've built the business when it comes to the back end of stuff that's what i've enjoyed more than anything else um i wanted to create a brand that had first of all i wanted to create a brand that was like fun and colorful and you know it was light-hearted sure. um, but then i also created a brand that I wanted my employees to be a part of. Um, so like a brand that like my, like I have a lot of guys that work here 
that they're like loyal to the brand and not Casey. Cause like okay. I, that's how I've always wanted it. Where it's like, we are a collective of grown men that have, that have built a business together and it's based around this brand. It's like the logo, right? It's the, sure. it's, the, it's what they look towards, right? And it's like, this is what this is what I'm loyal to. This is why I provide a good service is because of the collective, because of the brand. And that's what they're loyal to. So it's like, it plays on my employees as well as with the customers. And for us, I went with like bright colors because I basically wanted to be remembered. I've always thought, you know, there's a, there's a couple of big brands out there and people will see them enough and if they see their their colored truck they'll know exactly who it is and i've always wanted and i think we've done a good job of if somebody sees a baby blue truck driving by they instantly think stand up guys sure um so with me the brand one of the biggest aspects of the brand is the colors like everything i do has the baby blue i won't make I won't make things that don't have baby blue on it you're not gonna i'm not gonna give out shirts that are green or white or anything like that. It's like everything has to be baby blue. Our website's baby blue. Anything we put on social media has got baby blue on it. Like everything is revolved around that color. So we've branded a color so that it's always associated with us when customers see it. Is there anything specifically you can do to make safety a culture within your business? So for us, the big, you know, we push safety on the job obviously, but that has to, that's, that's more of like, you just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Um, and and you, you build leaders within your business that are going to identify when people are doing something unsafe. That's a big one. Okay. But with us, driving is the number one thing. Um, so we have ways that we grade people when they drive. Okay. So, and that's what gets measured, gets improved. So when these guys see their scores, they're always trying to be better, right? So it's like not being on your phone because the, the, there's GPS and there's a camera that's kind of watching what's happening. So not being on your phone helps your score, not stopping too fast, not not going over speed limit, all these things. And then sure. every morning at our huddles, the day before is talked about. Okay. With the, you know, so it's top of mind and it's measured. And it, you know, we saw drastic changes by just doing those two things, measuring it and talking about it on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah. Is, is there such thing as a typical client for you? I, I know that we talked about, you know, going into targeted areas and things like that. Um, but is there just a standard customer for stand-up guys? Well, we have like an ideal customer, but everybody has junk. Like, <laughs> right. you know, like uh, I would say the, the decision maker in a, in a suburban household is our avatar. Like that's who we're going after. Okay. Um, but there is, I've seen every situation you can imagine, every different type of person and every different type of geographic area and everybody has junk. So we're not, you know, we're inclusive to everyone that has it because like everybody's got it. Sure. Um, but because like our prices aren't the cheapest, we are going to go after customers that we believe can easily afford our service, sure. right? And the people that are looking for a company that's insured and you know marketed and we vet our employees like things like that like people will pay extra for that type of service but there's a certain type of people that will pay that right sure. so that's kind of who we go after but that's going to be like the upper middle class middle to upper middle class suburbanites i would say okay and there's a lot of them out there right <laughs> yeah. yeah everybody's a customer right? everybody's a customer yeah. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the equipment that you guys use right now is there like a standard uh truck or setup that you use out on the road? Yeah, so we are, um, a lot of other companies in our industry are catching up to it, but we were one of the fir we, uh, first ones that I know of. Um, but we went with a, so we have, well, we have the same trucks as everybody else. They're Isuzu NPRs, but the rig that we have on the back of them uh, is what you call a switch and go. Okay. And so that allows the dumpster that's on the truck to come on and, on and off the truck. Most of the main franchises and the large businesses and most people that you see is they have dump trucks and there's nothing wrong with dump trucks, but they're not quite as versatile. And that's why we went with the, we went with the, the switch and go because I can buy four trucks for a location with switch and goes and 15 dumpsters. Okay. Right. So then I have like, we have a lot more versatility. You can, you can, you can do a lot more. If the dumps are closed, you can, you can drop a bucket or a dumpster and pick up another one, you know, things like that. Or you can go to a job and bring three dumpsters with one truck back and forth and, and, and do the work that way. Like there's, sure. there's versatility to it. And also my guys love it. Cause if you're getting rid of a piano or something, they can just put the dumpster on the ground and slide the piano in rather than have to pick it up. Sure. So yeah, that's, so we use the switch and go system on, 
80 or 90 percent of our trucks okay. we still have a few like dump trucks that are dated from when we first were getting into that but i i prefer the switch and go so to wrap it up can you tell us a story of any difficult clients or interesting situations that you've run into over the years of stand-up guys junk removal we work with a property management company that sends us list of addresses and we go in and we clean out the homes so usually it's hey go to this address Here's the lockbox code, gut the whole house. Um, my guys went to one one day and then they, they finished it and then it's like, all right, we're gonna hit the next one on the list. And it was like 121 West Main Street. And they, they, get, they get there and the lockbox code doesn't work. So they call the office, the office calls the customer and the customer's like, look, this is an important property that we have to list. So just if you got to break a window just get in there we'll pay to fix it but we got to get this place cleared out so my guys go around the back they take a screwdriver they break in the back window they reach around they open the door and then they clean out all the junk sure we get a call the next day from the customer and they're all upset and they're like we asked you to go ahead and find your way into that house and that stuff the house is still filled with junk it turns out my guys went to 120 west main drive something like that rather than street and they completely cleared out a house that they were not looking to get rid of junk um the guy had was in the process of moving so he happened to have a lockbox on the on the door and we threw away probably a truckload of his new things and that is that was not a good look on us but it's like you know that's one of those things where it's like things happen and sure that was a terrible situation <laughs> Um, but that was probably the, one of the weirder things that's ever happened, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So you guys have been expanding a lot lately. What does the future look like for stand-up guys? I would say my goal is to, we want to double in the next two years okay. from where we are. So we have been, we've been working and we haven't opened a, a new location in, I don't know, eight, 12 months or something like that. But we've also been working on changing a lot within the company to, to be more profitable. To, to build other leaders and then to, to try and create a system to where we can open these quicker and more profitably. Sure. Um, and so when we want to start rolling that out in the next six months or so, and when we do, I, I, I want to double um, in yeah, the next 24 to 32 months. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Double locations, um, which then is going to, you know, just because you open up a new location doesn't mean you instantly, you know, have all the money that that location can generate in 18, 24 months. But that's like setting the stage for then the, the future after that. So speaking of pianos and things like that, is there anything that you guys don't haul? Dead bodies. <laughs> or dead animals all right um no we don't like we get asked a lot about like uh, uh junk cars we don't take that you know people okay. ask that about all the time uh we don't take um we try not to take anything flammable um we're not going to take a bunch of gasoline or oil um but for the most part we'll take if, if it can be picked up by two guys we'll we'll take it cool well thank you so much for your time of course, man. we appreciate you sitting down with us yeah